Greetings, Compass Church and friends, and happy Mother's Day. You know, one day a year just simply isn't enough to say thank you and to honor our mothers. And to those of you who are mothers, never underestimate the significance of what you're doing or what you have done. You have the most important job in the world and there's no greater calling or privilege than to shape the life and the values of a child, especially when they're young, but even when they're grown. So even if your nest is empty, your job is never done. Motherhood is a very powerful responsibility. Well, today we're going to take a brief break from our study in Hebrews because we want to honor mothers. We want to hear what God has to say about them and to encourage them. You know, teaching our kids or our grandkids spiritual truth, it's a great challenge. Um, but sometimes it, it seems like just keeping them clean and fed and healthy is hard enough. Anyone who thinks that a mom who chooses to stay home with her children that she isn't working, well, they should be severely flogged. Um, some moms have to find a job outside the home. But that is a second job because being a mom is a full-time job. It's a job that is worthy of our respect and honor. And I want us to honor them and say thank you together. So wherever you're at, at home, with, if you're with a mom or not, let's just say thank you, mom. Thanks, mom. Thanks for helping me do that. Well, to ignore the significance of motherhood really is to ignore history. Uh, history is full of evidence that more than anyone else, mothers have shaped the world we live in today. In fact, the Bible is full of evidence for this conclusion. Mothers have a very special and divine role in the plan of God as it unfolds in Scripture, especially in the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. In those stories, in that history, we see mothers who are used to accomplish great things and through their faithful and diligent ministry as a mom, the world is blessed. But we also see mothers who are not faithful, mothers who use their influence for evil, and it destroyed their husbands, their children, and many other people. Motherhood is a big deal. So here's our big idea for today. Mothers are powerful people. Every mother has the opportunity to change the world for better or for worse. It's a serious job and one we need to respect and honor. And we need to help the mothers in our lives in any way that we can. Well, here's a picture of my mom. I th think I've shown this picture before. Uh, this was their 50th anniversary. And this year, uh, my parents will be celebrating their 60th anniversary. Hard to believe. But she became a follower of Jesus when I was a young boy. And I remember my mom reading her Bible. Sometimes she would read her Bible more than I wanted her to. But her love for Jesus and for her family laid the foundation for me to come to faith as a young adult. And as I look at that picture, I'm reminded that next weekend, her granddaughter, our daughter Emma, is going to get married. And I'm so grateful for the legacy of faith that my mom has instilled in my family. So thanks, Mom. And I'd like for all of us to think about the moms in our lives and begin our time by giving thanks in prayer. So let's pray. God, thank you for all of the moms in our lives. Lord, where would we be without these women who raised us, who cared for us, who loved us, 
who raised our children, who raised our grandchildren. Lord, mothers in our lives have made our lives what they are today. Uh, the world would be a very different place if these women had, did not have the courage, if these women did not have the strength to trust you, to follow you, and to boldly share those values and their character and their integrity with their children and with us. So God, we celebrate these mothers today and we thank you for the divine role, the special part that you have given mothers to play in your plan. Lord, open our eyes to see again afresh how important it is, um, how vital mothers are in our culture and in our lives and in our church and in our families. So God, uh, thank you for your word. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, on this Mother's Day 2020, we need to remember three very important things. First is the importance of obedient parenting. And we're gonna be in three primary texts today, but I'd like you to first Find the book of Deuteronomy in your Bible. It's the fifth book from the beginning. It was written by Moses as Israel was about to come into the promised land. And if you remember last week, we talked about the, the tragedy of Israel saying no to God. He was inviting them into a special relationship. They actually got to hear his voice at the base of the mountain but fear and a lack of a vision to be with God caused them to refuse. They rejected God's invitation. And God respected their decision. If you say no to God, he will respect your decision. He does not force you to draw near he doesn't force you to love him and to experience the glory that he wants to share with you. But plan B for Israel was actually much harder. Okay, so God gave them all of these laws and these commands. He appointed priests to stand between God and the people. But he didn't give up on them. Not yet. And as they're about to enter the promised land, after 40 years of wandering around in the desert, here is the plan that Moses gives them. So in Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1, this is what we read. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. That's pretty gracious, pretty merciful of God to give them that opportunity after they had rejected him. And then Moses lays out for them the primary way for them to prosper as a people. And it has to do with obedient parenting. If they want a legacy of faithfulness, here's the plan. A legacy of faithfulness begins in our hearts. Look at verses four to six. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Obedient parenting that changes the world begins right here in our hearts. 
children are not destined uh, to be like mom and dad, right? Children make their own choices for better or worse. But if parents want their children to know the Lord, to follow him in faith and obedience, then the first step in parenting is to be the example that our children can follow. Now, there's no guarantee that they will. But if parents don't love the Lord, like it says here, then children most likely won't be encouraged to love the Lord. But if they are encouraged to love the Lord and the parents aren't an example of that, then the kids will see the hypocrisy and they will most likely reject that kind of religion. Now, this doesn't mean that parents have to be perfect. Okay, let's just get rid of that phantom of a perfect mom or a perfect dad right now because they don't exist. Loving God, following him, uh, having his commands on our hearts, it doesn't mean that we never fail. It means that the direction of your life, the momentum of your life is clearly moving toward God. Okay, it looks like progress, not perfection. And kids will see that in parents. When parents fail uh, and they confess their sin, when parents ask for forgiveness, and then they get back up and they keep following Jesus, it shows what's in our hearts. And when what we preach is actually evident in our lives. It gives us the platform to do the next thing. A legacy of faithfulness must be impressed on children. Look at verse 7. It says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. Being an example is not enough. We need to explain and teach children why we do what we do and why it's God's best plan for them. This is hard work. Um, godly parenting is not what happens when we just put our homes on autopilot. Okay? When we are not intentional, when we are not diligent about impressing God's truth on our kids, even if we are being a good example, when we don't take seriously teaching and training, then things go south pretty fast. And soon, it's Lord of the Flies at home. Now, you may have heard this cliche that when it comes to raising our kids and passing on beliefs and values, that those things are often more caught than taught. It's a catchy phrase, and it's probably meant to confront parents who don't practice what they preach, but really it's a false dichotomy. It's a false comparison. Both are needed. Obedient parenting that leaves a godly legacy takes faith seriously in mom and dad's heart first. Okay, that's the caught part that they get. But then it's intentional about impressing that faith on children by teaching them diligently. It's both caught and taught. And then Moses raises the bar on the importance of obedient parenting even higher. A legacy of faithfulness is lived out 24 7. Look at verses 7 to 9. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Well, a mom or dad could get overwhelmed with that description of obedient parenting. But if 
parents love God, if their faith is real and genuine, and if they're making progress personally in following Jesus, this is actually very freeing. You don't need to come up with some master plan or curriculum. The classroom for godly parenting is all of life. So obedient parents, they don't just show up on the way to church um, or during family devotions or on special holidays or praying before the meal. When we compartmentalize our own faith and it only shows up at predictable times, we're actually teaching our children a very dangerous lesson. The invitation that God was giving to Israel, the invitation that God has given to us, is not to just add some religion or faith as an add-on in our lives. In, in the last few weeks, we've read this. God wants to share his holiness with you, his righteousness with you. God wants to share his love with you, his glory with you. But the only way we get that is by loving him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. It, it's not an add-on. It's an all-in. Are you all in. Obedient parenting is God's plan. And mothers are powerful people, but they do not have to be perfect people, okay? Like we said last week, we need to learn from past failures, um, and not just our own. We can actually learn a lot from the failures of others. And when it comes to leaving a godly legacy for the next generation, well, Israel failed miserably. They give us a lot to learn from. So number two, we need to remember the disaster of failed parenting. Now, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this on Mother's Day, but it's important to see the contrast. And, and maybe it will help you appreciate the mothers in your own life who are faithful. Because uh, the book of Judges, and that's where I'd like you to find uh, your way to, it's a couple books beyond Deuteronomy. In the book of Judges, there was a massive parental failure that had catastrophic results. At the end of Deuteronomy, Moses hands the baton of leadership to a man named Joshua. Uh, and Joshua conquers the promised land. And, and then we get to the, to the next chapter of Israel's history here. And in Judges 2, this is what we read, starting in verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation were also gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Well, considering what Moses had told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 6, that sounds like a massive failure. And it's, it's not that the children rejected the Lord. Um, that happens all the time. Even when mothers and fathers are obedient parents, like we just spoke about, kids still make their own decisions. 
But what does this say happened to the next generation? It, it doesn't say they rejected the Lord. Uh, it says they didn't even know who he was or what he had done for their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. Wow. Okay, so whose fault is that? It's the parents. Well, before we judge them too much, let's remember this verse from 1 Corinthians 10. We looked at it last week. Paul is reminding the church that what Israel did, it's massive failures. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. That's really good advice. And it may not look the same, but in our parenting, here's the reality, we are vulnerable to the same forces that caused the Israelites' failure. And there's three things in this story I want us to reflect on that we're all vulnerable to. And the first thing is distraction. I'm not going to retell the whole story, but can you imagine how it felt for these Israelites who had been born as slaves in Egypt? They had just spent 40 years wandering around the desert. They spent another 40 or so years fighting wars and battles to conquer the promised land. And finally, they have their own land. They have their own homes. You know, these were human beings just like us. And the affluence and the freedom and the prosperity that came with the promised land, it just consumed them. And it's like parents today who want to build a better life for their kids than they themselves had. So they get caught up and distracted by the dream of creating a better life on earth for their kids. And they get so distracted by that that they forget to point them to the real promised land of heaven. And so what do they do? They, they stopped telling the stories they stopped telling the stories of what God had done for them. Tell your kids, tell your grandkids the stories of what God has done for you. It's not downloaded magically somehow into their life. You need to tell them, pull out the photo books, share the testimonies, remind them of God's faithfulness and what he has done in your life. Well, this distraction led to the next thing that we're all vulnerable to, and it's complacency. I mean, they were just so busy with all these exciting opportunities they had in the land, uh, they must have stopped going to church um, or reading their Bibles. Okay, you, can, you can just imagine it. Well, I'll get back to my spiritual priorities once I plant this garden. Um, you know, once I build this addition on my house, once I harvest the grapes, uh, once I do one more thing. But that time never comes. You see, the, the good life is full of relentless distractions that lead us to put spiritual priorities on the back burner. But the longer we put our spiritual priorities on hold, the easier it gets to never pick them up again. So we see the Bible on the shelf and we just feel guilty. So what do we do? We put another book in front of it or we take the Bible and put it in a drawer or in a box. And eventually, there's nothing in our visible lives that resembles what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We're just like our unbelieving neighbors. 
Now, in our minds, we still think of ourselves as people of faith. But those who are closest to us, including our kids, would never think of us that way. There's no evidence of faith in our lives. Complacency. And, and when that happens, just like Israel, we too are vulnerable to the third thing, ignorance. Look at Judges chapter 2, verse 11. Actually, verse 10. It says, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. They didn't know. They didn't know. And it didn't happen in a day. It didn't happen uh, in a week. But, but over time, with many distractions, years of complacency, the result was ignorance. Uh, Moses told them very clearly in Deuteronomy 6, the plan to avoid that disaster was the responsibility of the parents. Parents are powerful people. God knew the key to an entire nation experiencing the blessings that God wanted to give them. Well, it was dependent on the faithfulness of moms and dads. Well, for, more, for 400 more years after this, Israel struggled. They suffered in the disaster of failed parenting. Now, obviously, these people and these generations, they made their own bad choices and they sinned. You, you can't blame everything on the parents, but you can't minimize the significance that their failure played. And the end of the book of Judges says this about these 400 years in Judges 21, verse 25. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Well, that might sound like freedom, but it was anarchy. It was disaster. And amazingly, it was at this point in history that things began to change. This is the point <clears throat> in time when the book of 1 Samuel begins. And it tells us what God did to change the course of a nation. So in 1 Samuel, if you'll skip by the book of Ruth, you'll come to 1 Samuel. It, this book covers just one generation. And by the end of the book, the situation in the life of Israel had changed beyond recognition. The nation is united. A legal system and a rule of law is established. The word of God is restored to the people. They, they are brought back together as a worshiping community. I mean, it's a great book. It's a great story in how in one generation, God restored all that had been lost. But what I want to notice is, is this. Where did it all begin? As you open the book of 1 Samuel, God wants you to know that the place he began when he chose to change the course of a nation was with one woman. Her name was Hannah. So on Mother's Day 2020, here's what we need to remember. Number three, the impact of faithful parenting. First Samuel chapter one, the, the first thing that we learn about Hannah is that she had a pretty difficult life. In verse 2, we see that her husband, Elkanah, had two wives. Now, her husband loved her, and according to verse 5, she was probably his first love. But she was not his only love. Hannah experiences all the pain and trauma that comes with divided affection. And the pain of Hannah's life was intensified by the fact that that the other wife had children, and Hannah did not. Well, then we have this encounter with the priest, Eli. Okay, Hannah is praying here in the house of the Lord. She's pouring her heart out to God. She's weeping. 
And the old priest, Eli, seeing the intensity of Hannah's prayer, he assumes she is drunk. I mean, can you imagine this poor woman? She comes to church to pour her heart out to God. She's praying, and the pastor thinks she's drunk. Talk about a lack of spiritual discernment for a pastor. Well, this is really a rough beginning for the book of 1 Samuel, and yet we worship a God who does remarkable things in strange places. And it's in this unlikely place that God begins a work that in one generation will change the course of the nation of Israel. Where does he begin? With one woman. So remember our big idea. Mothers are powerful people. So don't underestimate the power of one mother's prayers. 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 10. Hannah was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O oh, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall touch his head. And she continued to pray before the Lord. So Hannah takes all of that pain, the loneliness, the disappointment in her life, and through her prayers, she finds a release for her soul that she can't find in any other way. In fact, at the end of verse 18, it says, she went on her way and she ate and her face was no longer sad. There was a burden that the priest could not lift. There was a burden that her husband could not understand. But she's able to bring it to the Lord and she finds a peace and rest for her soul directly from the hand of God through prayer. Now, notice she is still without children, but somewhere in her prayers, she has found that there is a God she can trust. She can face the future no matter what it holds because God is with her. And if you'll notice the difference between her prayers in chapter one and what she prays in chapter two, You'll see in chapter one, her prayer is really just focused on the big hole in her life. Lord, I have no children. And she wept bitterly. But if you read the prayer in chapter two, this prayer is at a whole new level. She's praying at a much deeper and broader level. She's praying about God's holiness, about peace, about war, about the poor, about the hungry. And through her prayers... Her obedience and her intimacy with God, her perspective has grown. She, she begins to see the world the way God sees it. And, and her prayer lifts her out of the small perspective of her tiny life. You see, prayer does that for you. As you seek God in prayer, your perspective about life grows. So God starts and he uses one mother's prayers. And then he uses one mother's character. As you follow the story, God actually answers her prayer in verse 20, chapter 1. The Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Great news. Now, remember, she had made a vow to the Lord back in verse 11. If you will give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Well, it's one thing to make a promise to God in a crisis, but it's another thing to keep your promise. 
once the crisis has passed. Have you ever made a promise to God uh, if he would help you? God, help me to pass this test. Uh, God, help me to get this job. Uh, God, help me to get out of this mess. And if you do, I promise to X, Y, Z, follow you, uh, serve you, uh, give, whatever that promise was. You know, one of, one of the greatest tests of our character is when God actually gives us what we desire. Well, that happened to Hannah. God gave her what she desired. And the question now is, will she keep her promise? Well, Hannah keeps her promise, even when it's costly. I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been to give her son away, to serve God in another place at what must have been a very young age. But she did it. And Samuel grew up knowing this. My mom keeps her promises. It's a matter of character. And we don't know how old Samuel was when he was brought to the temple. Uh, chapter 2, verse 24, um, actually chapter 1, verse 24, tells us it was after he was weaned. But we don't know how long after. But notice the last verse of chapter 1, we read that he worshipped the Lord there. Okay, so Samuel was obviously old enough uh, to worship. Um, it suggests he, he wasn't a baby for sure. And in verse 11, we see that after Samuel was left at the temple, it says he ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So he was able to make a contribution. I think it's fair to assume Samuel was with his mother long enough for her to have the formative influence on his life. And he grew up knowing, listen, mom keeps her promises. Samuel not only saw her character, but he saw her, her joy. Uh, her prayer there in chapter 2 is a description of her joyful praise to God. It's a song she wrote to express her praise to the Lord. In fact, chapter 2, verse 1 says this. Uh, My heart exalts in the Lord. My heart rejoices in the Lord. This is very powerful in the life of a child. Moms, dads, okay, parents, let your children see you praise God. Let them watch your experience and your relationship with God. Even if it's come later in your life, okay, maybe you missed the early years. Don't dwell on what you've missed. It's never too late to let your kids and even your grandkids see your love for Jesus. And that brings us to the last thing. One mother's influence. What would Samuel have learned from his mother? Well, there's some simple little things that stand out in the passage. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says, She named him Samuel because I asked the Lord for him. Okay, the, the name Samuel means gift from God. So Samuel must have grown up knowing and hearing this from his mother. Your life is a gift from God. Samuel, every time she called his name, you're a gift from God. What a contrast to the culture around him where the people did not know God or what he had done for them. It also seems clear that his mother taught him that his life was to glorify God. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 28. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. So it wasn't a surprise when Hannah took Samuel to the temple and left him there. She had prepared him for that. She not only taught him that the source of his life was from God, she taught him 
the purpose of his life. Samuel, you're a gift from God. God's given you life. Uh, but we live in a very dark world. And God gave you this life so that you would be a light shining in the darkness. And you will glorify God. That's the purpose of your life. And then she taught him this. He needed to have a sacrifice to have peace with God. Look at chapter 1, verse 24. The day he was brought to the house of God, as, as young as he was, his mom brought him along with what? A bull. I mean, can you imagine what Samuel must have thought? I, I know what my kids would have thought when they were little. Hey, mom, what are we bringing a bull to church for? Oh, uh, you'll see. They come to the place of worship. They bring the bull to the very center. <clears throat> the priest comes out. There's a lot of other people. And then all of a sudden, the boy begins to figure out what they're going to do. He realizes what's going to happen next. And he says, Mom, what are they killing the bull for? You know, a small boy would never forget seeing his first sacrifice. But what Samuel saw was for a very good reason. The animal sacrifice was God's way of teaching the people. They could only be brought into a right relationship with him through a sacrifice being made. Hannah, his mother, is showing this to him. Samuel you need to understand that even as a little boy, you don't just walk into the presence of God. You need to have a way opened into the presence of God. And that happens with an awful price. The shedding of blood. You see, the Old Testament sacrifices paved the way so that people would, would understand, so they would appreciate a much greater sacrifice. Jesus Christ was crucified for us as a sacrifice for sins so that we can have peace with God. Samuel was influenced by his mother. And when 1 Samuel, the book begins, uh, the word of God is hardly known in all the land of Israel. But if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, this is what we read. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. The little boy became God's mouthpiece to the nation. Within one generation, God used this one man to establish law and order. He anointed the first king. He united the nation. He reestablished the worship of God so that God was known. In 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2, tell us where it all began. One woman's prayers, one woman's character, one mother's influence. So let this be a, a word of encouragement to us today. If you're a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, especially if you're a mother, never underestimate the significance of what you're doing. You're doing the most important job in the world. And there's no greater calling or privilege than to shape the life and values of a child through your prayers, through your character, and through your influence, God can change the world. And for all of us right now in the midst of this strange and unprecedented time, this, this global crisis caused by a virus, never underestimate what God can do in one generation and never underestimate what God can do through one person who chooses to be faithful and obedient. 
Let's pray. God, we want to be those people. God, we, we want to trust you um, just like Hannah in the midst of a world that seemed very dark, uh, seemed very far from you. Uh, she made a decision to trust you. And God, we want to do that now for ourselves first in our hearts, but for our families, for our extended families, for those in our community. Lord, help us to lead by example. Help us to, to lead by, by teaching, by impressing what you have impressed on us, to share that boldly with others. Lord, I pray for especially the mothers, uh, the grandmothers uh, in our lives. God, would you uh, encourage them? Would you give them extra boldness and strength um, to be like Hannah, uh, to lead the way in their own example, um, but to, to lead the way in with their words, uh, with their integrity, and with their character. God, help all of us to be a help to mothers in these days. And God, would you use them to change the world? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, thanks for worshiping with us. Uh, thank you for hanging in there with us. Uh, let me also encourage you to go back to the newsletter, our website, and uh, would you let us know that you worshiped with us by filling out the, the Connect form online. Uh, you can share a prayer request, share a comment that might encourage us, uh, and also indicate how we can serve you. All of our small groups are now meeting on Zoom, and we're ready to invite you in uh, to those communities. So just indicate on that connect form you want to join a small group, and we'll send you the links and, and how you can join up and be a part of that. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.